and welcome to a new season of Hot Topic for which we have invested in a table. And in this first episode, I'm very pleased to say my guest is Philip Norton, Lord Norton of Louth, uh, Professor of Government at Hull University and University acknowledged expert on the British Constitution. Philip, thank you so much for coming in. Pleasure. Uh, 1982, you wrote the Constitution in Flux. Well, it looks a lot more in flux now than it uh, was I know, then. I know, I know. I, I keep being invited to do a new edition, but I can't think of a new title that's better than that. I mean, how do you say the Constitution in even more flux? In a way, it was prophetic, and lo and behold, um, we're in a situation where, when I was invited to a recent article on constitutional change, is it unfinished business? My argument was no, because it's not unfinished business, because that implies there's an end point. It's actually never-ending business, because we've no clear idea of where we're going, because there's no clear concept of the type of constitution that we think is appropriate for the United Kingdom. We're going to end up with a constitution to the sum of the parts of discrete and disparate changes that we've made to the constitution over recent decades. It seems particularly dynamic at the moment, and we'll come into some of the details mm. of that at the moment, but in a moment, the, the fact is that it's always, it's not particularly more mobile and dynamic now, it's always in, in flux, it is, it's, it is evolutionary. Well, it has been evolutionary. The, the extent of flux is distinctive in the past 30, 40 years, more so than the past 300. We've certainly had periods where there have been significant constitutional change, major change, quite uh, dramatic, but then there's been a period of bedding in before moving on to some more significant change. Whereas what we've seen over the past 30, 40 years has been several significant changes, roughly in the same period, when we've not had a chance to think, well, how do they relate to one another? How do they fit together as a whole in terms of what constitution we deem appropriate for the United Kingdom? So we've moved from a situation where there was general acceptance of the framework of our constitution that was appropriate and, and largely seen as uh, delivering what was expected of it to a situation from the 60s and 70s onwards where people have challenged it. They've been saying we should have this change, that change, and some changes implemented, but each advocated on its individual merits, not because it's seen as a part of, of a wider package, a clear view of where we should be going. So in that sense, we are in a new era of, of constitutional change. Well, let me commit that sin and go to some of those mm. individual uh, changes rather than looking at the whole mm. thing. Uh, ever up to date on Hot Topic, uh, I'd just like to take you to the Act of Proclamations of 1539. This is the, uh, the, uh, the Henry the VIII, VIII clauses yeah. in the Great Repeal Act that's, t that's, that's taking us out yes. of the laws of the European Union. Just take us through, how much power does that give the executive rather than Parliament to well, as, legislate? As the bill is presently drawn, the EU withdrawal bill, it gives significant powers to the executive because essentially it's saying to ministers, you can change the law to try to transpose European law into British law but it gives them tremendous scope for how they do it and whether in effect they gold plate it. So in other words, they might be able to implement policy changes through that transposition because there aren't sufficient limits within the bill at present in order to constrain them. So the only changes they make are necessary for the purpose of transposing EU law into UK law. And so that's executive action that they can take without coming to Parliament at all, without the scrutiny of the legislature, there, there, the elected House. There is some provision for, for Parliament to be involved, but in many cases it's negative. In other words, it will take effect unless Parliament does something and then votes against it, rather than required to come before Parliament to approve it before it takes effect. So rather than what's known as the affirmative resolution procedure, it's not implemented unless Parliament said yes. It's the negative resolution, which it takes effect unless some action is triggered in Parliament, there's a debate, and you say no to it. Presumably that won't be a power that, that, that ministers have uh, of their own initiative, as it were. Uh, that won't affect finance, won't, won't affect large spending or raising money, raising tax no, or, or No, because or that's separate from the process. What the, we're concerned with is transposing existing law. And because we've built up over so many years a massive body of law derived from our membership of the European Union, which has been embodied in different forms. So it's not we just pass an Act of Parliament to give effect to it. That's the easy bit, because Acts of Parliament stay in force. We don't really need to do much there. It's when they're put in different forms, secondary legislation, other forms, that they need changing, um, that you've got a problem. You've got other problems as well through the way law is interpreted. So court well, judgments, case law of the what's now the Court of Justice of the European Union, embodying that and and then at what point do you close off judgments when on exit day does 
the case is still being considered, carry on, or do you cl close them off? So there's all sorts of issues like that. And you have also, by... presumably, the conflict between a British common law tradition yes. and the Roman law traditions of the court, European Court of Justice. Yes. And that, in that, that again, evolutionary uh, yes. set of common law development is, is, doesn't apply there in the same Correct. way it applied here. So that, yes, and that adds to the complication. There's a further complication because of the body of law that's built up over time. The, the bill, as presently drafted, um, creates a new body of law called retained EU law, which is partly problematic because it, it retains measures that are only acts of parliament, so they don't need to have a separate category anyway. And it's, it's unclear what the status of retained EU law is in British law relative to our extant law, that is primary legislation or secondary legislation. So that adds to the complication as well. So is this Brexit or no Brexit, but is, it, is this being used effectively by the executive as a bit of a power grab? It could be, some of the provisions could be used for that. That's why Parliament has to be vigilant. That's why we're scrutinising the bill to try and limit it so that ministers can only do that which is demonstrably necessary to transpose EU law and cannot be used for other purposes. There is something of a conflict between the government's view, which views this process um, as technical, and in Parliament, where many of us regard it as a major constitutional matter. Let's move on to a slightly different subject, still to do with Brexit. The status of British citizens mm. uh, who live within the European Union, outside Britain. We know the status of EU citizens in this country. Clearly one of the reasons that people mm. voted the way they did in the referendum was because they, they don't, for some reason, they don't like so many foreigners working and thriving here. But what will be the status of a British citizen resident uh, in a European Union country? We don't know yet, because um, this is part of the negotiations, and obviously they, one can use that as leverage, um, because you've got the issue of what will be the status, what will be the agreed status, and then who will police that status? Because um, obviously that's an issue at the moment, because the EU is saying, well, um, EU citizens in the United Kingdom, in other words, non-British nationals, or EU citizens, um, their status should be under the aegis of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Of course, we're saying, well, actually, no, we're no longer part of the European Union, therefore the court should not have jurisdiction. And, of course, then what happens to British citizens within the EU? So this is part of the um, negotiations. Uh, it says in the inside page of my passport that the Foreign Secretary requests and requires foreigners to help me without letter or hindrance. It's a rather an arrogant requirement, isn't it? Um, well, it's a traditional. That, that, that's uh, Britannic Majesty's uh, Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs will make such requests, but that's to pass unhindered. Um, it, it doesn't say requests um, that you be given a certain status once you've taken residence somewhere else. I don't think I can imagine Boris Johnson marching into the bar in Benidorm and giving me a hand there. You never know with Boris Johnson what he may get up to. Uh, let's move off Brexit a little bit. Another constitutional issue is about the levels of government that we have. Mm. This is sovereign parliament, yes. and that's, and, and that's uh, uh, itself controversial. Oh, indeed. Uh, one of those, another of those constitutional changes in the last 30 or 40 years, we've had referenda on uh, Scottish and Welsh autonomy, on uh, uh, proportional representation voting systems, and now on the European Union. Uh, we seem to be, it's only four or five referenda, but we seem to be st developing a bit of a habit for direct democracy. We are in the habit of using more referendums than we've done uh, before, and Parliament does use referendums rather than referenda, um, simply because... It is, it is wrong. Uh, well, ref it is referendums, because uh, referendum uh, as a gerund has no plural in Latin. Very well, Philip. Let's, so, move, let's move on. So, uh, <laughs> so Parliament accepts that, so we use referendums. And the Constitution Committee in the House of Lords, we produced a big report back in 2010 on the use of referendums. Um, and our, our point was, during what we've just said, they're now part of our constitutional practice. So, because I've always argued against them, got a principal objection, but we're in a situation where they've been used. You can't undo them. So now you're in a situation where clearly if there's going to be major constitutional change, there's going to be an argument it has to be subject to 
referendum, and that's what we've had, both at devolved level, so Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, but of course we've had three UK-wide referendums on continued membership of the European Communities, on the electoral system back in 2011, and of course last year on leave or remain within the European Union. And they create all sorts of issues. You've got the point or the problem about those subjects that are not subject to referendum, because of course people say, well, it's not legitimate now unless they are subject to a referendum. Then when they are, you've got the issue, which I raised when the um, EU referendum bill was going through, but nobody picked on and pursue it. Um, should you have a, a threshold requirement? Should you have to have at least two thirds voting yes for fundamental change. And of course, we didn't do that. A simple majority sufficed. So you've got all sorts of issues about the conduct of referendums. You've also got well, a fundamental well, issue I'll, I'll about have accountability. To, I have to stop you there. We'll come back to referendums after the break, though. But uh, do, do join us then. Welcome back to Hot Topic. I'm with Lord Norton of Louth, Philip Norton, Professor of Government at Hull University. Philip, we were talking about referendums. You corrected me in my, my poor Latin. I, I, just, I just thought it was second declension neuter. Um, but you were saying that you had an objection to them. Oh, well, there is a fundamental issue raised by reference in terms of accountability. Because if electors vote a particular way, things go wrong, how do they hold themselves to account? because you're just isolating the issue, deciding it, it can have all sorts of repercussions. There's no mechanism for thinking about, well, how does it fit with other things? How do you then uh, deal with that if, if things don't work out in the way you expect? And you think, well, gracious, that's a big mistake. How do electors hold themselves to account? Well, there's also, is there not a, a problem in terms of endurance? When we elect mm. a parliament, then we can change that parliament oh, within, yes. within five years. Uh, and we, we get regular chances to, to sack them. If we have a referendum, we don't then, every five years, have a revisit to that question and see if we've changed our minds in the same we, way. There's not, well, there's not in a structured way in the way we do with um, elections, but referendums typically don't necessarily solve an issue, because after a while people start wanting to undo it and go back to it. It's how long you do that. But the point is people will start demanding a new referendum. I mean, we've even got that, of course, in terms of... Uh, current negotiations are people effective saying, oh, there should be a second referendum. So it's not as decisive as on the face of it you would think. It can be if something happens immediately, there's a vote, you decide on it. Um, but um, otherwise, as I say, it doesn't actually close off the issue. People will keep going on until there's a second one because we don't have any provision as to where and when there should be another referendum or any provision that would close that off. Can we still say, as we students of politics have sort of rather proudly said forever, that we have a sovereign parliament, that our sovereignty still lies in parliament? Formally, yes, um, because of course it's parliament that has to prescribe there will be a referendum in the first place. So there's no automatic trigger uh, for holding a referendum. So parliament has to legislate on each occasion. So every referendum that's been held it's because of Act of Parliament. Now, in some acts, of course, we, pres well, really in, only in 1979, prescribed there would be a threshold. Um, um, and, for example, in, in the 2011 vote on uh, changing the electoral system, we also provided it be binding. So whatever the result was, that would take effect. Most referendums we provide for are not binding. And the fact we didn't make the EU referendum last year binding has created all sorts of problems. Let's get let's get remain in Parliament and your end of the building with a red leather in the House mm. of Lords and its role here. Uh, we have a minority government. The the government does not have a majority in the House of Commons, which makes it extremely vulnerable not only to votes in the House of Commons if it doesn't, for instance, receive the support of the Ulster Unionists, but also vulnerable to the House of Lords as a checking chamber. Well, the, the emphasis there, you're quite right, is checking chamber, because ultimately the Commons can get its way. So if the, the government can command the majority of the Commons, ultimately uh, it could achieve the outcomes it wants. So the House of Lords cannot pass something and override the Commons, whereas the Commons can override the Lords. Um, doesn't happen much since 1949, the 1949 Parliament Act. That's only been used four times by the House of Commons to override the Lords. So it's not usually a, a conflict. We will make amendments, government may lose votes, goes back to the Commons. Quite often they accept our amendments because they improve the bill. Uh, if they say no and send it back, normally we'll give way. We can insist. So it might go back and forth, what's known as ping pong. Ultimately, we, norm we give way because the Commons 
uh, is entitled to its primacy. So the issue there from government is what you've just touched upon, is actually maintaining its majority in the House of Commons. There is, I always mention this whenever I see you, the Salisbury Convention, which is that the House of Lords doesn't resist uh, measures that are in a government's manifesto. The principle yes. being, Lord Salisbury brought this in after the 45 election when Attlee got a landslide. Indeed. That, and it was a very conservative House yeah. of Lords. That the, uh, the, 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 don't do that because the government has a, a mandate. Well, this government doesn't necessarily have a mandate. Does the Salisbury Convention still apply? It, it does um, on certain issues because the focus that people have about the Salisbury Convention is the one you've mentioned, that it's what's in the manifesto and that the Lords would not reject on second reading or third reading any measure that was in the government's manifesto. But that's to focus on the form the principle takes and not the principle. Because in 1945, the then, he's actually Viscount, Viscount Cranbourne at the time, he became Lord Salisbury, he was not creating uh, a new principle. He was reiterating one developed by his grandfather, the third Marquis, um, back in the 19th century, known as the referendum theory. And he was the last member of the House of Lords to be Prime Minister. I think. Uh, well, it depends how you class the Earl of Whom and who became Sir Alec oh, well, Douglas. Yes, yes. Um, but he was the last Prime Minister to sit in the uh, uh, Lords. But this was before he became Prime Minister, its leader of the opposition. Because um, obviously there was an issue there. There was a Conservative majority in the Lords and you had a Liberal government. Um, so Salisbury developed the referendum theory. The Lords was entitled to reject a measure and if it not been put to the country, if the view of the country was not clear. But if the view of the country was clear, they would accept it, and normally that was expressed through a general election. Um, so in '45, what we were saying was effectively enunciating that in the new circumstances, that if it's clear the government's, the, the will of the people is clear, we'll accept it. And of course, over time, you'd got the mandate theory of a manifesto being put before the electors. They'd been approved at an election, therefore you accept um, that. So anything approved by the electorate this is relevant in this context because we've had a referendum on leaving the EU. So you could argue, therefore, that the decision of the uh, electorate is clear. They've already expressed their opinion. Therefore, under the principle of the Salisbury Convention, um, we are bound by that. The House of Lords is enormous. There are lots of you, yep. uh, my dear Baron, and, yes. and, uh, and it is not uh, representative in terms of parties, not even close to representative, mm. and a quarter of them are Liberal Democrats, and they've only got, what, eight seats in the House of Commons. Oh, yeah, but, you're yeah. very involved in, uh, I beg your pardon, but you're very involved in, in reform of the House of Lords. Yes. I, I notice you've got a book. Well, that's very kind of you to draw attention to the latest, uh, well, my latest book, not my latest publication, but certainly the latest book, yes, which actually addresses the different approaches um, to the House in terms of reform, of which reform is just one of the options. So what I characterise as the four R's, retain, reform, replace or remove altogether, which is a way of conceptualising it. They're mutually exclusive and it's exhaustive in terms of what you do about it. Because when you think about reform of the House of Lords, it's not about functions. People don't really debate those. It's about composition. Yep. So there's no real argument about what it does, because when the government's proposed reform, it's always been on the basis, what it does is fine. We don't have a problem with the functions. They're appropriate to a second chamber. It's who's carrying them out. So the debate is on composition. So retain is keep it as an appointed chamber, probably reform it from within, which what various of us are trying to do and actually have achieved various changes. Reform is have a minority of members elected. Replace is do away with it and have a majority of members or whole wholly elected chamber and remove altogether would be abolition and just have a unicameral legislature. So those are the options. Um, so you've got that debate going on, but then you've got a debate within the House itself about size and we accept we're too big. At the end of last year we passed a motion in the Lords unanimously, there's no disagreement, that we're too big and we need to take steps to do something about the it. The problem is when you want to uh, cull peers, so it's, it's, it's which ones... Uh, oh, I can tell you uh, what, They're all well, going to think that they're the ones who should survive. Well, I can tell you, you should go on my basis, we've, because the Lord Speaker then set up a committee that's about to report next month, looking at different options. Um, and what I've been advocating is you do it on the basis of attendance. So let's say we need to reduce 200, get rid of 200 members. Well, go, look over the past three years, who are the 200 least good attenders? And I think that's perfectly defensible. It's those who are contributing least 
who go. So you privilege those who are actually contributing to the House of Turning Up and doing the work of the Chamber. You've still got 92 hereditaries in there, mm. of course, with their weird by-election system. Yeah. Is it really defensible that anybody should be involved in legislating in a sovereign legislature because their ancestor came over with the Conqueror? No, and in a way, technically they don't because they no longer do it automatically because they then are chosen, but it is from the body of hereditary peers from which they're chosen, that's the problem. Um, so we are trying to get rid of the by-election um, provision. Um, and my argument's always been, well, you know, if you've got hereditary peers, if they're able, they can be offered live peerages if they've got merit. And of course, some have. What, you over, what people overlook is there's more than 92 hereditaries in the House. Uh, some have been offered live peerages. And, the, and taking life peerage, as Alec Douglas Hume did when he went back yes. into the House of Lords. Oh, indeed. Uh, and and uh, Hailsham and others. Uh, yes, absolutely. Very quickly, uh, your, that's your, your uh, ermine uh, uh, answer. Let yes. me give you a, a professorial uh, question as well. You're a professor at university. It's cost £9,000 or so to go to university. And uh, having a degree is no longer exclusive or in any way really indicative of a particular quality of intellect. Why would people bother to go to university? Well, I think two reasons, which has always been the case. One is for the intrinsic worth of the study itself, what you're learning, so personal development, what you gain from it, which are very particular. And it's still an investment. It's an investment for the future. So your degree isn't an end point. Um, coming back to something you were talking about earlier, it's the equivalent of a passport. It's your passport to the future because it's with you always when you want to go on, achieve something, uh, get out there into the, the wider world. Um, or to use another concept, it's a springboard to the future, what you do with it. So although more people have got degrees, they're still of value for your future careers, but they're of intrinsic worth. You've got something from them even before you go and out one to the hopes that there is a great deal of delight just in the practice of study. Oh, but absolutely. That's on, my point on, about this intrinsic worth. On absolutely. That, on that note, Philip, a uh, happy note. I'm going to have to stop you there, though. Thank you so much Pleasure. for coming in. Join me again next week for another hot topic.